blessed Thursday morning, everyone. Today is May 12, 2022, and hashtag Team LRC is back for a new set of learning sessions through our webinar series entitled Research is Life, How to Ace Your Research Paper. Kumusta po ang bawat isa sa ating? Bangon na po tayo sa ating mga kama at ihanda ng ating mga sarili para sa ating mga matututunan ngayong umaga na ito. So sa mga kapwa kong mga mahilig magkape, cheers tayo dyan para, sa, para tuluyan tayong magising ngayong at ang magising ating mga diwa ngayong umaga na ito. At syempre, hindi pwedeng hindi ko batiin sa araw na ito si Ginoong Gien Garma ng College of Development Communication dito sa UP Los Baños na nagdiriwan ng kanyang kaarawan ngayong araw na ito. So happy birthday, Sir Gien, mula sa hashtag Team LRC. Kaya naman sa mga nakatutok sa ating FB Live, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. So, wow, ang dami na ganda naka-tune in sa ating FB Live. So magandang umaga po sa inyo. Let us know kung saan po kaya nanonood ngayong umagang ito. Please comment them down below. Shout out sa ating mga early birds, si Noel G. Vinegas. Good morning. Ito na ang ating mga senior high school students from Bautista National High School. Shout out po sa inyo. Ang unang nag-greet is si Rose Marie Tomas. Good morning. Uh, let's see. Good morning kay Orly Halog. From, let's see. Send, from, ah, from the College of Holy Spirit, Caloacan City, Aaron Daniel Sarmiento. Good morning. From Misamis Oriental, Aris Luciana. Good morning po sa iyo. From NEU Lipa, Batangas. Sa ating mga Batanggenyo, good morning po, Aurora de Luna. Let's see, let's see na pa yung ating mga kasama ngayong araw na ito. Ma'am Jojo Rington, good morning po sa inyo. Sa ating mga very supportive uh, followers ng uh, Learning Resource Center, si Ma'am Jojo Rington. Good morning po sa iyo, ma'am. So let's see, yan ating mga senior high from Pampanga State Agricultural University. So, Jazer Santo Domingo, good morning po sa iyo. So, wow, madami na pong pumapasok sa ating FB Live. So, dito pa lang, ramdam na ramdam ko na na eager na tayong matuto sa regarding sa topic natin ngayong araw na ito. So, kung wala pa po dito ang inyong mga friendships and colleagues, ay itag na po natin sila dito sa ating FB Live at ishare nyo na rin po ang ating video para sama-sama tayong matuto sa umagang ito. As of this morning, we already have around 7,340 registered participants. So grabe talaga. Ganyan kadami ang mga, mga guro at mag-aaral na eager matuto pa tungkol sa research. So talagang full force tayo dito, no? mga teachers, students, and aspiring researchers, young, research, young researchers na sama-sama tayong lalaban para sa ating mga research papers. So sa ating mga graduating scholars ng bayan, kapit lang po at i-manifest at uh, i-claim natin ng hashtag Sablay 2022 QT. Diba? At also, I'd like to congratulate lahat ng mga nakapasa sa Civil Engineering Board Exam na I think lumabas kahapon, last night ata. So congratulations po sa ating mga bagong ingenyero ng bayan. So I hope on board na po tayong lahat. Time check. It's already 9.04 in the morning. Welcome to Research is Life, How to Ace Your Research Paper. For this webinar series, mga kaibigan, our team prepared 10 sessions for us to fully appreciate the value of research in our life as teachers and students, as well as to learn different tips and strategies on how to further improve and ace our research papers especially for our graduating students who are currently working on their undergrad thesis, master's thesis, and PhD dissertation. So, sama-sama po tayong matututo sa araw na ito. So, I'd like to introduce myself once again. I'm Joshua Michael Jonas, University Research Associate of the UPLB Learning Resource Center, and yours truly, Paul, will be our webinars moderator. So we are now in our seventh session entitled, Have a Date with Data. So magde-date tayo ngayong umagang ito, pero with data. So common statistical analysis used in quantitative research. So in our previous sessions, we already had 
a comprehensive overview on the agenda, the social relevance of research, pati na rin ang paggamit ng ating library resources sa basics ng paggawa ng ating RRL at paano nga ba i-integrate at i-note ang gender and ethics sa ating research. So today, we will go to the more quantitative part or the more... Uh, dito? to the methods or analysis part na ng ating research. So we will be first talking about today the quantitative aspect of research. Tapos bukas naman yung qualitative aspect. So our speaker today will be providing us valuable insights about the difference of descriptive and inferential statistics at ano nga ba yung mga statistical tools na maaari natin gamitin at appropriate gamitin sa ating mga research. Kaya sit back, relax, ihanda ang ating mga ballpen at papel, pati na rin ang ating mga calculator siguro dahil magko-compute tayong ngayong umagang ito. We're gonna have a date with data. So just a few friendly reminders for our webinar this morning. Number one, at all times, please keep your comments helpful and considerate to the speaker, to the moderator, and to your fellow participants. Second, if you have questions, feel free to write them down below our comment section and make sure, please make sure that they are relevant to the topic this morning. And last but not the least, please do not forget to answer the evaluation form after the webinar. Our team will deeply appreciate your comments and suggestions. Please also be reminded that the deadline of responses will be until 10 p.m. tonight. So for those who will not be able to join us today because you have an equal important meeting or matters to attend to, don't you worry. You can always watch the replay of our sessions on our Facebook page. So upon checking kanina, we already have around 94,200 strong followers. So talaga naman pong kami sa Team LRC ay lubos na nagpapasalamat at ang inyo pong suporta sa aming mga programa at serbisyo dito sa LRC ay pinapataba lalo ang aming mga puso at nagiging inspirasyon namin para mag-move forward sa mga susunod pang mga taon. Likewise, you can also watch the recorded sessions on our YouTube channel. Just search UPLB Learning Resource Center on YouTube. We now have around 2.79K subscribers. No? Parang mga vloggers na rin kami. So please, Continue to like, share, and subscribe. And also click the notification bell to keep you posted with our recent videos. We would also like to invite you to follow and connect with us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. So kindly use our official hashtag for this webinar series, which is hashtag research is live. For the seventh time, uulitin natin na papanindigan natin na ang research ay talagang part ng ating buhay. We cannot not research sa ating araw-araw na buhay, di ba? So, para din mabilis natin makita ang lahat ng videos at mga materials ng ating webinar series using that hashtag. Okay. So, moving forward sa ating uh, session ngayong umagang ito, we'll first have a quick energizer. So, if you already attended our previous webinars, alam niyo na po ang gagawin dito. Hindi na kailangan sabihin yan. So, sa mga ngayon pa lamang po susubok, madali lamang po ito. First, open a new browser or a new window. Then, go to www.menti.com. And second, kindly use the key code that you see on your screen, which is 75092409. And answer the question you see on your screen. So allow me to put it first in the in our comment section para madali po natin makita. Let me put it in the comment section. Ayan. Okay. And we will now go to our energizer. Okay. So allow me to share my screen. Ayan. So, the first question for our energizer is konting review lang with uh, our topic or with our session with Dr. Pam Custodio last week, uh, last Thursday. No? So, the question is, bakit nga ba important or mahalaga ang ethics sa research? Why was it, uh, based from the discussions 
and the insights shared by Dr. Custodio last Thursday. Ano nga ba ang kahalagahan ng ethics sa ating mga ginagawang research? Especially when we are dealing with human participants or uh, yung ating mga communities. Bakit nga ba? Let's read your, ano, your thoughts. Accountability, protection. Yes, I believe protection is very important. We protect the, the dignity and the, the, the data, the private information of our participants. Ensure valid results. Do no harm. Exactly po. Let's see pa ang ating mga responses. Credibility, confidentiality. To measure credibility, protection yan. Uh, let's see. Protect the participants. Exactly. Human rights protection, yes, because we would do not want, di ba nga ang final words ni Ma'am Pam last uh, session, do no harm in your research, di ba? Uh, ang ating research should aim to help our communities, not harm them. Okay. Let's see. Let's, see. Let's uh, look at the thoughts of our fellow participants in our session. So we have 61 respondents. So... Right, and pabuti ng 70, 70 respondents. Let's see. So nakikita natin dito sa ating word cloud, no? Ang pinakamalaki ay protection, accountability, transparency, credibility, do no harm. So let's see. Last one. Human research, conflict resolution, under, to understand better. Last respondent, yan, 70 na po tayo. Okay. So these are very good insights no? or um, what we recalled from our session on research ethics. So palagi po natin tatandaan ang kahalagahan ng ethics sa ating research. Kasi una-una, it would reflect you as the researcher. So let's proceed to our next question. So our next question is related to our session this morning, what statistical analysis or tools have you used in your previous researches or are planning to use in your present research or study? Ano nga ba for sure um, may na foresee or may na iisip na kayo na gamitin na statistical analysis, especially for quantitative research sa ano yung ating mga gagamitin. Hindi pwede hindi tayo magsistat <laughs> sa ating mga research. Statistics is integral to any research paper. So we have your linear regression. At para may idea din ng ating speaker here in the Zoom space kung ano na nga ba yung mga alam natin na statistical analysis with regards to quantitative research. We have your correlation, ANOVA, analysis of variance, no? T and, v, T and Z test, T, T test correlation, structural equation model, difference among group, paired sample T test, Pearson, Sarah, Spear, Monroe. Pa ba? Parametric, non-parametric. Weighted mean. Yung ating ano, no? mean, median mode. Yung, I still recall yung aking ano, first time na nag-statistics nung high school. No? Yun yung mga hindi ko makakalimutan na lessons talaga. Mean, median, and mode. Analysis of variance. Yung ANOVA. Ating T-test. Yung Z-test. Shapiro Wilk test, wow. Regression. Mm. Ah, so I see here that some of you are using SPSS, yung software na for statistical analysis. Sige, pabuti natin ng, kaya ba natin ng ano, 60 responses? Sige. 54. Baba, mga linear regression, yung Pearson's. Naisip ko tuloy bigla, ano nga ba yung ginamit ko ng undergrad research ko na stat analysis? Kasi si sir, si sir, yung speaker din natin ngayon yun, yung tumulong sa aking research, sa aking thesis with regards sa stat analysis. So, ma ano nga, ma-recall ko nga mamaya kung ano nga ba yung ginamit ko na stat analysis. Yun yung para, uh, I don't know kung nare-recall mo, sir Enzo, na yung... Correlation, Spearman's correlation at top of, I don't know. I'll check my undergrad thesis, Mamel, for as my assignment. So, yan, sige. 
So I think we already have a handful of responses with regards to ano nga ba yung nagamit nyo na na statistical analysis at yung mga ginagamit or gagamitin pa lamang na statistical tools sa ating mga research. So thank you very much sa mga nag-participate sa ating energizer. So talagang at least mai-imbibe natin yung ating uh, statistics sa ating puso at isipan ngayong umagang ito. So, uh, before we proceed uh, sa ating session proper, I would like to invite you, uh, our dear participants, to view, read, and share LRC social media cards entitled Hashtag Thesis It. So, we are currently showcasing some of the best undergraduate thesis in UPLB wherein we present the information about the student's research, the results and significance of the study, and the tips of the author for students pursuing their research. So our third installment, which will be posted this afternoon, is entitled Condition Factor of Juvenile Nile Tilapia Cage in Lake Sampalo, Calibato, and Mojicap in San Pablo, Laguna. So this is uh, by uh, Ms. Casey Joel D. Detalo. So this is her undergraduate thesis, and she was awarded as the best thesis. No? in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Yes. Best thesis in veterinary physiology in 2021 at the College of Vet Med here in UPLB. And her advisor is Professor Michelle Grace V. Paraso. So if you want to learn more about her thesis, kindly check our uh, social media cards later this afternoon. So ang isang tip na shinare niya dito sa ating mga researchers is to always refer to the objectives of your study regularly. So, palagi po natin babalikan ng ating objectives, ng ating research, dahil dito iikot kung saan nga ba tungkol lang ating pinag-aaralan or ating pinag-re-researchan in the first place. So, thank you very much, Ms. Detalo, for sharing your research with us and our participants. Thank you and padaya. So, let's now go to the main part of our session. Allow me to introduce to you our speaker for this morning. John Lorenzo A. Yambot is an assistant professor at the Institute of Statistics, College of Arts and Sciences here in UP Los Baños. He finished his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Statistics also here in UPLB, and he was awarded the 2016 UPLB Outstanding Teacher for the Physical Sciences Junior Faculty Category and was given the one UP Faculty Grant Award in Statistics for Outstanding Teaching and Public Service in UPLB from 2019 to 2021. He has taught a number of undergraduate statistics courses and has co-authored two books in statistics and mathematics. He has been involved in many research studies and endeavors and presented a handful of papers in conferences. He is a member of the Philippine Statistical Association Incorporated and has served as resource speaker and facilitator in many statistical trainings and workshops. Here to share with us, us here to share with us common statistical analysis in quantitative research. Please welcome in the Zoom space ang aming lodi sa statistics dito sa hashtag Team LRC. Walang iba kundi si Assistant Professor John Lorenzo A. Yambot. Sir Enzo, good morning po. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, sir. Nakita po tayo George. ulit ang LRC at nice CB, sir, and sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's nice to be back after ilang months lang din naman po, sir. No, parang our last time po was yung sa ating recruitment program last year po. No? So ngayon tayo po ay bumabalik ngayon naman with statistics as our topic. So, Correct. sige po, sir. You know how the Zoom space po. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So good morning, everyone, and I hope you can uh, see my screen. All right. Thank you. So maganda umaga po sa ating lahat. Ay sana po ay maganda ang inyong gising. Sana po ay nasa mabuti kayong kalagayan at uh, may energy para po i-absorb yung mga statistical concepts na either i-review or i-recall natin or bago nyo pong matututunan for today. Okay, so this is session 7 of Research is Live, a webinar series on how to ace your research paper. 
So for today, we will discuss some of the basic concepts in the several statistical analysis used in quantitative research. So again, ako po si Enzo. I'm from the Institute of Statistics, uh, College of Arts and Sciences, UPLB. So for the next hour, so I hope mapupuno po ng uh, learnings, especially sa statistics, yung magiging uh, discussion po natin. So for the outline of the topic, so we will be uh, dividing this discussion into three main parts. Of course, we first start with the basic concepts. What's the difference between observational studies and experiments? Number two, how do we summarize data graphically and numerically? And number three, what are some of the common misconceptions in inferential statistics? So sabi nga po ni Josh kanina, kung kayo po ay regular na na nakikinig or nanonood po ng mga webinars ng Team LRC, um, hindi po ito yung first time na nagkaroon po tayo ng webinar on statistical analysis used in quantitative research. If I, will, if I can recall po, I think sometime around July 2020, yan, nagkaroon po tayo ng webinar on data visualization and on the use of MS Excel in data analysis. So, kaway-kaway po dyan, sino, sino ba yung since July 2020 ay kasama na po ng Team LRC sa kanilang mga sa kanilang mga webinars. And of course, nagkaroon din po tayo, I think that was sometime around September or October 2021 ng again, another webinar series on statistics. Kung natatandaan nyo po, ito po yung one stat at a time. So, meron tayong three sessions noon. One is on experimental designs. Two is on the parametric and non-parametric methods. And three is on correlation and regression. So kung isipin po natin ay hindi naman po na ganoon uh, kabago, lalo na dun sa mga avid viewers natin, yung mga discussions natin on statistical analysis used in quantitative research. So that's why uh, may isip ko din po, napakahirap na pagkasayin lahat ng mga methods in statistics sa isang oras. In fact nga po, pag nagkakaroon ako ng mga trainings on basic statistics, isang linggo po yun, five days, eight to five. So isipin natin, paano kaya natin mapagkakasya yung lahat sa isang oras. So that's why po, doon sa part na yun, yun sa mga tools in statistics, I decided to present the common misconceptions that I have observed in regard to inferential statistics. Right? So kung kailangan po natin ng info halimbawa doon sa or recall kung paano gamitin yung ANOVA, paano gamitin yung t-test, paano mag-correlation, paano mag-regression, I invite you to check the Facebook and YouTube page of LRC and we have a rich discussion of these topics in our one stat at a time webinar series. Okay? So but don't worry again, re-review natin sa today but our, our main focus will be on the common misconceptions in inferential statistics, which I think is very important since okay, um, some of you, if not all, will uh, request the services of a statistician. And si statistician, ang kaya niyang mabigay sa inyo most of the time is yung statistical aspect or statistical interpretation ng mga results na nakuha niya from the analysis. Okay? Yung practical interpretation, syempre, nakabato na yun sa researcher. So ngayon, minsan, in our attempt to translate or to, uh, yeah, to translate yung technical interpretation into the practical interpretation, doon tayo nagkakaroon minsan ng misconceptions. So that's why I thought since this is about research writing, mas maganda siguro na i-address natin for this session yung mga common misconceptions in inferential statistics. All right? So, for our learning objectives, at the end of our session, you must be able to, number one, discuss the basic principles for designing and conducting observational studies and experiments. Number two, summarize and interpret data using an appropriate graphical and or numerical tool. And number three, correct common misconceptions in inferential statistics. So, ready na po ba tayo? So, kapet? And let's start our learning session in statistics. So I'd like to start my discussion with um, some reflection on the recent events that has happened in our country. So hindi lang po election, simula pa 2020, with our experience in the COVID-19 pandemic, our news has been full of numbers. 
diba? Especially during the start of the pandemic, it was full of numbers uh, pertaining to the number of cases. For the first time, nakarinig tayo, baka yung iba, nakarinig ng mga terms na positivity rate, attack rate. Okay? Tapos recently, because of the lo- national and local elections, biglang naging curious tayo on how surveys work. Biglang naging curious tayo sa regression. Biglang may mga lumabas ulit na mga concepts ng law of large numbers and so on. So in other words, sabi ko nga po kanina, our news has been full of numbers. And these numbers, regardless of the events that we are following, shape how we view the world. In fact, regardless kung ano man yung experience natin sa COVID-19 pandemic, sa elections, these numbers, even before, tell us what to do. Diba? For example, these numbers tell us what, sh- what we should eat, how do we keep safe, how the economy is performing. And just recently, in some cases, some people also use these numbers to decide who should they vote for. So it is very important that these numbers are correct. However, there are also cases that some numbers in the news Instead of informing us, they actually misinform us. So given these premises, as a researcher, you should not only assure that the right information is extracted from the data. Paano kaya tayo makakarating doon sa right information kung yung data natin ay questionable? And ripple effect yon. So as a researcher, you should also assure that the methodology that you use to obtain the data is also correct. So as Ronald Fisher, the uh, father of modern statistics said, to consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can perhaps say what the experiment died of. Okay? So this is actually the motivation why I prefer to start the discussion with some of the basic concepts in observational studies and experiments. Meaning, dapat sa, sa design stage pa lang po ng ating research, naka-incorporate na po yung statistics. Because if you have several misconceptions on the design of your study, magkakaroon din po ng grave effect yon sa analysis part ng study natin. Sabi nga po dito, if you have already finished your research and may mali dun sa methodology na ginawa natin to obtain the data, kung ano man yung nakuha natin, yun lang yung gagamitin ng statistician or natin as a researcher. Walang iba pang technique sa statistics na pwedeng mag-solve ng, naso- ng na-collect na na data. Diba? Kasi yun na yung nakuha natin. So we, we should work around with that kind of data that we have collected. And sadly, sa experience ko as a statistical consultant, may mga ila-ilang cases tayong ganito. Diba? So, ibe-break na lang natin sa client yung bad news na, sorry po, kasi ganito natin kinolek yung data natin. Mali yung methodology natin. And kung ito po yung proposed na analysis tool natin, sadly, hindi po natin siya magagawa kasi ganito po yung kind ng data na nakuha natin. So, nakita nyo po yon. So, ibig sabihin, Sa buong stage po ng exploratory analysis ng data exploration, sa collection, sa pag-manage ng data, sa analysis, sa interpretation, nandun po dapat yung statistics. So, having said that, let us proceed with the first topic, and that is on some basic concepts in research studies. Now, there are two types of research studies, and these are the observational study and the experiment. Now, as the name implies, observational study is conducted in which researchers simply observe or measure the participants about their opinions, behaviors, or outcomes, and these participants are not assigned on any treatments or conditions. So in other words, you just record the responses, you just record the characteristics of your participants, and you do not ask them to do something differently. On the other hand, when we say experiment, this is conducted when the researchers manipulate something and measure the effect of the manipulation on some outcome of 
interest. So, in experiments, participants are usually assigned to various conditions or treatments in which we now measure the outcome given this exposure to the various treatments or conditions. Now, in both studies, whether observational or experimental, we are always interested to learn the effect of one variable in terms of another variable. So in other words, in both observational or experimental studies, we would often encounter a response variable which measures the outcome of our study and an explanatory variable which is thought to explain or cause the observed outcomes. Now, however, in some cases, there is also that potential that the results of a experimental or an observational study may be wrongly interpreted because of variables that are not of primary interest to us as a researcher, but are heavily influencing the outcomes of our study. For example, po, very basic example on nutrition studies. For example, if we say that people who, he, who eat high fiber diet have a lower incidence of heart attacks, so pwede nating sabihin na either an increase in the intake of high, high fiber diet decreases the risk of heart attack. But given this scenario, it could also be that those people who are eating high fiber diet also are physically active. So in that case, we cannot fully attribute the low incidence of heart attack to the intake of high fiber diet. Because we saw in that example that somehow physical activity is confounded to the high fiber diet. It influences the risk of having a heart attack. So that kind of characteristic in our study is what we call as a confounding variable. So confounding variable is actually not a variable of interest or a characteristic of interest in our study, but it influences the outcome of our response. And we cannot separate that effect from the explanatory variable. That's why we have to account for it. Now, as an example of a confounding variable and the presence of a lurking variable in, uh, in our study, I would like to share with you a video that talks about lurking variable or confounding variable in our in a research study. Statistics are persuasive, so much so that people, organizations, and whole countries base some of their most important decisions on organized data. But there's a problem with that. Any set of statistics might have something lurking inside it, something that can turn the results completely upside down. For example, imagine you need to choose between two hospitals for an elderly relative's surgery. Out of each hospital's last 1,000 patients, 900 survived at Hospital A, while only 800 survived at Hospital B. So it looks like Hospital A is the better choice. But before you make your decision, remember that not all patients arrive at the hospital with the same level of health. And if we divide each hospital's last 1,000 patients into those who arrived in good health and those who arrived in poor health, the picture starts to look very different. Hospital A had only 100 patients who arrived in poor health, of which 30 survived. But Hospital B had 400, and they were able to save 210. So Hospital B is the better choice for patients who arrive at hospital in poor health, with a survival rate of 52.5%. And what if your relative's health is good when she arrives at the hospital? Strangely enough, Hospital B is still the better choice, with a survival rate of over 98%. So how can Hospital A have a better overall survival rate if Hospital B has better survival rates for patients in each of the two groups? 
What we've stumbled upon is a case of Simpson's paradox, where the same set of data can appear to show opposite trends depending on how it's grouped. This often occurs when aggregated data hides a conditional variable, sometimes known as a lurking variable, which is a hidden additional factor that significantly influences results. Here, the hidden factor is the relative proportion of patients who arrive in good or poor health. Simpson's paradox isn't just a hypothetical scenario. It pops up from time to time in the real world, sometimes in important contexts. One study in the UK appeared to show that smokers had a higher survival rate than non-smokers over a 20-year time period. That is, until dividing the participants by age group showed that the non-smokers were significantly older on average, and thus more likely to die during the trial period, precisely because they were living longer in general. Here, the age groups are the lurking variable and are vital to correctly interpret the data. In another example, an analysis of Florida's death penalty cases seemed to reveal no racial disparity in sentencing between black and white defendants convicted of murder. But dividing the cases by the race of the victim told a different story. In either situation, black defendants were more likely to be sentenced to death. The slightly higher overall sentencing rate for white defendants was due to the fact that cases with white victims were more likely to elicit a death sentence than cases where the victim was black, and most murders occurred between people of the same race. So how do we avoid falling for the paradox? Unfortunately, there is no one-size-fits-all answer. Data can be grouped and divided in any number of ways, and overall numbers may sometimes give a more accurate picture than data divided into misleading or arbitrary categories. All we can do is carefully study the actual situations the statistics describe and consider whether lurking variables may be present. Otherwise, we leave ourselves vulnerable to those who would use data to manipulate others and promote their own agendas. Yeah, so based on that uh, video by Ted Ed, we saw that confounding variables or confounding characteristics are actually nuisance variables that get in the way of the relationships that we want to study. So as a researcher, your job now is not just to uh, focus or just look on the picture that is provided by your data. So yun yung importance ng uh, pag-review natin ng mga related literature. Diba? Yung importance ng pagtingin natin, pagbalik natin sa conceptual framework. Okay? Because as a researcher, we would like to remove or minimize the effect of these variables. And how do we remove or minimize the effect of these variables? We must first recognize that there is a chance that confounding variables might be present in our study. So in reality, because of this um, presence of confounding characteristics, we already have several techniques or tools on how to uh, incorporate the presence of confounding variables in our study. And this would usually involve uh, doing it in the design phase of our study. So I don't know if you have heard of um, techniques such as yung Hawthorne, placebos, randomized studies, control groups, or blinding experiments. So through these tools, we are able to recognize and minimize the effect of confounding characteristics that might influence the interpretation, the results, and the interpretations of our results. Okay? Now, moving on, uh, still on uh, further discussions about observational studies. Observational studies have two main goals. First is to learn about the characteristics of a population. And second is to assess if there is a potential association between two or more variables. So when we say learn about the characteristics of a population, it may be, for example, you have a hypothesized value and you want to check if the data from your sample is consistent with that hypothesized value. Pwede rin po yung pag-compare ng two or more populations that is still included in learning about the characteristics of a population. 
Now, when conducting an observational study, it's important to differentiate between retrospective and prospective studies. So, ano pong difference nung dalawa? So, retrospective study, as the name implies, is a study of past events. Meaning, researchers would identify subjects that have experienced certain responses and trace or look back if these participants possessed various factors or characteristics that might explain why or that might explain what happened with regard to their responses. So kung pwede nating isipin para siyang Y to X, so you already have the responses, ngayon hahanapin mo ano kaya yung mga characteristics that influence this response. So, ang information na meron ka is on the dependent variable. Okay? Ngayon, you will get information from the independent variable. Now, prospective, on the other hand, is a study of ongoing or future events. Meaning, kabaliktaran siya ng retrospective. You identify subjects or participants based on explanatory variables or based on factors. And then, you follow these participants and record their responses in the future. So, baliktad. So, from X to Y, from independent variables na nakuha mo, you now trace and record their responses. Another thing that you should also differentiate when conducting observational studies are the difference between cross-sectional and longitudinal studies. Pag sinabi po natin cross-sectional, we conduct the study at a single period of time, but we conduct it two different sets of samples. On the other hand, pag longitudinal naman po, we conduct the study at different time periods, but across these time periods, we are just looking at the same set of samples. Of course, we would not say that one study is more superior than the other. Hindi po ganun yun. Because deciding between retrospective or prospective or cross-sectional or longitudinal is a decision that is based on your goal. It is based on the question that you want to answer. And in some cases, it is also based on the resources that you have to conduct your study. Now, in reality, conducting an observational study presents some challenges. And these are, first, the researcher can only observe, not control the explanatory variables. Second, the researcher cannot adjust for confounding variables that no one has considered. And number three, a causal relationship cannot be established. Now, these challenges are actually rooted to the very basic idea that in observational study, you just observe. Diba? Ibig sabihin, we do not directly control how the participants or the units will respond to the explanatory variables that we are inspecting. So that's why if there are other goals that cannot be answered by an observational study, for example, ang pwedeng research question natin would start with, what happens when? What is the effect of? So in other words, what if your study deals with the effect of certain explanatory variables on our response variable? So recall from our earlier definitions that this kind of questions can be answered by conducting an experiment. And recall from our definition earlier that an experiment is a study in which we manipulate or control a set of explanatory variables and observe its effect on our response variable. Now, again, we would use the terms explanatory, response variable, but in experiments, we would also encounter terms such as levels and treatments. When we say levels, these are just the possible values of our explanatory variable. When we say treatment, it is a particular combination of the levels of each of our explanatory variables. 
Now, when conducting an experiment, our guiding principle is that a well-designed experiment requires more than just manipulating the explanatory variables. The design must also eliminate other possible explanations or the experimental results will not be conclusive. So, a very basic principle of the design of experiments is, of course, recognizing, again, that there are other factors or characteristics that can influence your response. And how do we recognize and minimize the effect of these characteristics or factors? We apply some of the basic principles in experimental design. First is replication. That is making multiple observations. In most cases, the recommended is at least two units for each experimental condition. The ultimate goal of replication is to isolate the variation due to the experimental units and the variation due to our treatments or our explanatory variables. The idea is that replication will help us assess and differentiate the natural variation in our responses uh, with our, the natural variation in the responses among the units receiving the same treatment and the variation attributed to the differences with the treatment. Next is random assignment. A random assignment ensures that our experiment does not systematically favor one experimental condition over the other. Ang basic idea lang po ng randomization or random assignment in the, in the experimental designs is that it attempts to create experimental groups that are very similar to each other as much as possible. Now, by applying replication and random assignment, it allows you as a researcher to be reasonably confident of comparing experimental groups because you have a measure of the natural variation versus the variation due to the treatments, and you know that the units in each treatment group do not systematically influence each other. Next, we can also apply the principle of control or by, again, initiating a control group in our experiment. Ano po yung concept ng control group? It is simply a group of subjects or experimental units that are treated identically in every way except that they do not receive an actual treatment. Next, you can also apply the principle of blocking. That is, when you think that a certain factor can influence the behavior of your units, you can actually create groups based on this characteristic or factor. And we call these groups as your blocks. And then for each block, you implement all the treatments. Now, when we now proceed with um, the analysis part of our study, we should first be aware that there are two major areas of applied statistics. And these are the descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. So I assume that most, if not all of you, have sufficient background in statistics from your high school, from your college, or from your post-graduate studies. But the very basic principle between the two is that descriptive statistics, as the name implies, aims to describe the data at hand. So this is concerned with the methods for organizing and presenting our data. On the other hand, when we say inferential statistics from the root word inference, that means we aim to make conclusions or generalizations about the population based on the characteristics that we have observed on a representative of the population. And if we recall from your basic statistics, this is the way how we describe inferential statistics. So we start with a large set containing big units or observations. From the large set, we get smaller set, preferably a representative 
of the population, which consists of small n units or observations. Now, ang question natin, paano po natin ma-assure na yung small set ay representative ng large set? Pag-uusapan po natin mamaya yan when we go to sampling. Now, this is not yet inferential statistics. Hindi lang siya concerned on getting the small set from the large set. Para mabuo yung complete picture, take note that inferential statistics is concerned with using the information obtained from the sample to make inferences or generalizations about our population. So, ang sinasabi lang po natin dito under inferential statistics, we are saying that whatever characteristic the smaller set has, it will also be true for your larger set. Now, assessing whether your sample data can be valid for inferences about your larger population, you should be aware of how the sample was obtained and, of course, how the responses were measured. Now, before going to yung sampling method natin, let us also recall that under inferential statistics, we have two common procedures. First one is estimation. And as the name implies, recall that this is simply concerned with finding a value or a range of values that we think would best describe our unknown characteristic of interest from the population. Next is a test of hypothesis that is confirming or verifying a claim about, a pop, about the population. And again, it is just based on the sample or the data that we have collected from the small set. Now, ang first consideration natin under the process of inferential statistic is, of course, ensuring how we get a representative of the large set. In other words, how do we obtain samples? And in order to do that, we must first be aware of the two types of samples. First, we have probability samples. And probability samples are obtained using randomization, meaning you are using an objective chance mechanism to select the units of your sample. Now, there are various ways or various methods on how you can implement randomization. So, ang pinaka-basic po natin dyan, draw lots method. But of course, with the technology, with the softwares that we have, you can actually just um, produce or create a set of sample with just a click of your software, for example. Ba? O kaya kahit Excel, alam natin na pwede tayong mag-generate ng random numbers using Excel. But take note, randomization will always require you to have that list of the units in the population. So hindi pwedeng yung randomization natin ay pipikit lang tayo tapos turo lang tayo ng kung sino. Hindi po ganun. Kasi sabi natin, objective dapat yung chance mechanism natin. And, involving, and implementing randomization again will involve a list of all the units in your population. Now, kaya po siya tinawag na probability samples basically because of the term probability. Kasi anong meron doon? Pag sinabi kasi nating probability sample, we can or we know that each and every unit in the population has a known and non-zero chance of selection. Ano pong ibig sabihin nun? Pag sinabi po nating non-zero chance of selection, ibig sabihin ay we are giving each and every unit in the population an opportunity to be selected. And later on, knowing that opportunity or chance or probability to be selected will help us assess the accuracy and the precision of the results that we will obtain from our study. In other words, yung probability na nakukuha natin from probability samples will help us assess the statistics or estimates that we will compute later on based on our sample. Now, given this idea, 
if you have probability samples, you there is a valid or it allows you to draw valid generalizations or inferences about the units of your population. Now, recall lang po natin or review natin that these are just some of the commonly used probability sampling methods. And again, um, there is not one method that is more superior than the other. Okay? Some methods may be easier to implement than the other. Some methods may provide better information as compared with the other method. But at the end of the day, the sampling method or the choice of the sampling method is dictated by the goal of your study, the characteristics of your population, and of course, the resources that you have to implement sampling. Now, review lang po natin very quickly. We have the following probability sampling methods. First, we have simple random sampling. So this is concerned, again, with selecting a sample of units in such a way that any sample of a given size has the same chance of being selected as any other sample of the same chance. Keyword po natin dito ay yung equal chance. Stratified random sampling, keyword natin dito is strata or stratum, meaning we are dividing our population into mutually exclusive subgroups, and then we take a simple random sample from each subgroup. When we say systematic sampling, as the name implies, we first order the units in our population, and then based on a fixed keeping pattern, we draw samples from that ordered units. Next, cluster sampling, keyword cluster. Same na idea ng stratified, we divide the population into mutually exclusive subgroups. This time, we now call them as clusters. Ang difference niya with stratified random sampling, recall natin, is that for cluster sampling, yung clusters mismo yung nirandomize natin. So we select one or two or more clusters depending on our study. And then from the selected clusters, we take all the units to form our sample. And the other one, we have the multi-stage sampling, which is simply concerned with performing sampling in different stages. So halimbawa po, pwede isipin natin na um, ito, pinaka narinig natin to sa mga election surveys ngayon. Multi-stage sampling po kasi yung pinaperform nila. So that is, for example, Diba, buong Pilipinas, pwede nating i-divide yung buong Pilipinas, say, into regions. Okay? Tapos, sa loob ng isang region, magse-select tayo ng province. Sa loob ng isang province, pwede tayong mag-select ng municipality or city, and so on and so forth. So, ibig sabihin po, yung ultimate units na makukuha mo is actually dependent on the units that were selected in the prior stages of your sample. Now, if you will uh, quickly think of it, yung multi-stage sampling, kung isipin natin, medyo magasto siya because it will, uh, any, it will um, require you to perform sampling at several stages. But of course, yung benefits din naman po ng multi-stage sampling, malaki din po over yung mga potential na mga um, resources na required to implement multi-stage sampling. Again, at the end of the day, the goal of your study, the characteristics of your population, and the resources that you have will dictate or will uh, be your guide in uh, deciding which probability sampling method to use. Now, the other type of samples that we have is what we call as non-probability samples. And these are samples that are obtained haphazardly, selected purposively, or taken as volunteers. If you heard of terms such as judgment sampling, convenient sampling, accidental sampling, non-probability samples po yung nakukuha natin from this sampling methods. Now, since your units were taken haphazardly, we do not know the probability of their selection. 
Now, since you cannot associate a chance of being selected, you cannot have an objective measure of the accuracy and the precision of the statistics or estimates that you will compute later on. That's why if you have non-probability samples, they are not valid for statistical inference. Meaning, whatever conclusion that you will have based on your non-probability samples will only be true for them. So kung ano man po yung nakuha yung results, hindi kayo allowed mag-generalize sa buong population. Because you were not able to assure that your samples were indeed representative of the population of interest. Now, that's why people would often say that non-probability sampling is generally biased. But take note, bias is not only introduced in the way we select the sample. It is also introduced in the way we collect data from the samples. And these biases, these are threats to the validity of the results of our selection. What are some of these? First is the selection bias. It is the systematic tendency on the part of the sampling procedure to exclude or include a certain type of unit. So halimbawa po, pwede nating isipin na meron tayong study that aims to, for example, estimate the expenses of a household. Okay? Yung list natin, nakagroup siya, for example, based on socioeconomic status. Ang napag-decidean mo na sampling method ay cluster sampling, meaning magseselect ka ng socioeconomic class, tapos kapag nakapag-select ka na, kukunin mo lahat ng units doon sa nakaselect na cluster. Now, performing that sampling procedure will definitely produce selection bias because yung units na naselect natin will heavily influence the responses that you will record. Diba? Kasi magko-concentrate lang tayo sa isa or sa dalawang socioeconomic status. In-exclude or in-exclude in na natin yung potential contribution ng ibang groups or ng ibang units doon sa makokompute nating statistics or estimates later on. So again, that's why it is very important to study the characteristics of your population because it will guide us in deciding the sampling procedure to be used. Next is measurement or response bias. It's the tendency for samples to differ from the corresponding population because the method of observation tends to produce values that differ from the true value. So, madami pong pwedeng um, influence dito sa measurement or response bias. First is, of course, yung method. Kasi lalo ngayon, nasa digital era na tayo, isipin natin na if ever we decide to collect data using emails or using online forums, lagi nating i-consider if the units in our population have access to the tools that we will use for data collection. Okay? Measurement or response bias can also be influenced by the way we ask questions to our units in the sum. Pwede kasi improperly worded yung mga questions doon sa ating questionnaire that it already influences how our samples will respond to our questionnaire. And the other common bias that we might encounter in our sampling is what we call as non-response bias. So yung iba po dito na nag-conduct na ng surveys before, I'm sure you are aware that we rarely achieve a 100% response rate. Unless kung very um, systematic, very organized yung naging data collection natin, it is possible to achieve a 100% response rate. Okay? But we must acknowledge the fact that not all the units in our sample will respond to our survey. So that's why you should also be um, aware of this bias which might heavily influence the results of your study. 
Now, as a final remark, with regard to the biases in our sampling, some people would say that in order to address these biases, we can just increase the sample. Okay? But take note, okay, increasing the sample does not always guarantee a decrease in the bias of our results. Okay? Because as you have seen in our definitions, bias is introduced in the method that we use to select our sample. So if our method is flawed, if our non-response rate is very high, then yung large sample size natin would have very minimal to no effect in our um, in reducing the biases of our study. Now, in sampling, as a final remark, uh, I would like to give this a uh, message that a good sample is a representative of the population in the sense that characteristics of interest in the population can be estimated from the sample with a known degree of accuracy. In other words, we cannot tell if a sample is a representative of the population by just looking at it. Our only assurance in, in saying that our sample is a representative of the population is on the method that we used to select the sample. So, next question. Probability po ba ang mas maganda over non-probability sampling? Now, nakita natin yung pros and cons. Pag probability sampling, pwede natin siyang gamitin for statistical inference. Pag probability sampling, meron tayong objective way of assessing the precision and the accuracy of our results. Meaning, we have a measure of how much confidence we have with regard to the results of our study. But in spite of this, some people would still opt to use non-probability sampling because non-probability sampling would require less time and less money. And aside from that, the characteristics and the nature of the population would dictate that they should indeed use non-probability sampling. So we need to debate na dapat ito kasi mas maganda ito, ito kasi mas, um, mas na-address niya yung flow ng isa, and so on. The bottom line is, in sampling, you should always be aware that whenever a proper sampling method is used, even a relatively small sample can be used as a representative of a large population. So again, nakita natin from our discussions that statistics do not only play a key role in the analysis of your study. Dapat yung statistics incorporated po siya even during the very first step of our design of our study. All right. Now, moving on, let us proceed with the second topic, which is on summarizing data graphically and numerically. So, sana po ay okay pa po kayo. Okay? Sana ay uh, review natin yung mga concepts in statistics that we have learned from our high school or from our basic stat in college or postgraduate studies. Okay? But now, assuming that we have already collected the data and we did it the right way, okay? so the next step would be to summarize our data either graphically or numerically. Now first, let's review some of the basic definitions. And we start with, of course, the characteristic of interest. In statistics, we call it as a variable. And the root word is actually vary or change. Ba? Kaya po siya tinawag na variable kasi yung characteristic na to, it is assumed to be different for every unit of the population, for a given unit in the population through time. So in other words, this characteristic can assume different values for different elements. Now, given this characteristic, a realized value of this variable is called an observation. 
And a collection of observations is now what we call as the data. Okay? So these are just some of the basic terms that we will encounter later on that we should be aware of the differences. So variable, observation, and data. Now, moving on, with regard to the variable, let us recall, actually, kahit hindi pa tayo nag-stat, alam na natin that there are two types of variables, qualitative and quantitative. Now, if your characteristic enables you to place an item or a unit into one of several groups or categories, qualitative yun. If your characteristics or if your characteristic takes on numerical values, alam natin, quantitative po yun. But more importantly, in statistical analysis, we should be aware that for each type of variable, there are levels of measurement that can be used and can and should be attributed whenever we are performing statistical analysis. First is, for qualitative, recall po natin that we can either have a nominal or ordinal level of measurement. Ano pong difference nilang dalawa? Basically, an ordinal variable has implied ordering, a nominal variable does not have that characteristic. Okay? So again, Nominal and ordinal variables both um, pertain to labels, categories, or, or characteristics that can be measured qualitatively. But the only difference is that ordinal variables have values that can be graphed. Now, on the other hand, for quantitative variables, it can be either interval or ratio. Ano pong difference nilang dalawa? The ratio variable has an absolute zero point. Meaning, if the value of the characteristic is zero, that means the characteristic being measured is not present. Now, a very good example of the difference between interval and ratio variable is temperature. Okay? Yung temperature po is considered as an interval variable because it lacks an absolute zero point. Meaning, pag zero daw yung measurement natin sa temperature, specifically if it is measured in degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit, it does not necessarily mean that temperature is not present. That that characteristic is not present. Tama ba yun? Halimbawa po, pag sinabi natin zero degrees Celsius, Ibig sabihin po ba nun, walang nag -e exist na temperature? Di ba hindi po? Pag zero degree Celsius yung reading natin, ibig sabihin po nun, temperature is still present. That characteristic can still be observed. In fact, di ba, we call that as your freezing. Okay? On the other hand, halimbawa pag sinabi natin number of participants in a training. Pag sinabi natin there are zero participants in the training, then we did not really observe that characteristic. So ratio variable yon, may absolute zero point yon. Okay? Now, you might ask me, ano pong bearing nito sa statistical analysis natin? Why should we be aware of the levels of measurement? Later on, you will realize that the statistical tool that you will use depends also on the level of measurement that you used in your data. So there is a specific statistical tool that can be used for ordinal variables. There is a specific statistical tool that can be used for quantitative variables and so on. Okay? And as a final remark, always take note that the level of measurement does not depend on the property being measured. It depends on how you measured that characteristic. Ba? Kaya nga siya tinawag na level of measurement. Kasi yung measuring process, yung magdidictate kung siya ba ay nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Okay? 
Kaya kung napansin niyo po, when I presented an example about temperature, I was very specific of saying that the temperature was measured in degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. That is to tell you that temperature was measured quantitatively. Kasi pwede rin naman po nating i-measure yung temperature qualitatively. Di ba? Pwede nating sabihin that it is warm or cold. Di ba? Pag ganun po, iba na siya. Hindi na siya quantitative. It is now a qualitative variable. Okay? So again, the level of measurement depends mainly on the measuring process. Right? Now, we now proceed with how do we summarize these variables? Of course, it differentiate po natin paano pag qualitative, paano pag quantitative variable. First is for summarizing qualitative variables. And we just have very few. For numerical summaries, we would usually summarize them on a frequency distribution table or on a relative frequency distribution table. O baka po hindi masyadong familiar sa terms. When we say relative frequency, percentage po ito. Okay? Because take note, in some manuscripts, we would usually opt to present the frequency side by side with the corresponding percentage. Now, for visual summaries, we have the very popular pie chart and bar chart. Okay? Now, just a very quick reminder, again, later on, we will present some of the best practices in our visual summaries. But a very quick reminder regarding pie chart. Take note, sabi ko nga po, it is the most popular, but it is the most misused. Do not use a pie chart when you have more than six categories. Okay? So, if ever you have several categories in which you want to present the percentages, you can just opt to use the bar chart. Okay? Remember, yung visual summary natin should aid us in interpretation. Yung charts natin, hindi lang po yan decorations sa ating manuscripts or sa ating research papers. It should represent the data that we are summarizing. So in other words, your charts should be easily understood. Okay? Kung marami ng slices yung pie chart mo, mahirap na yung intindi. Okay? Now, for quantitative variables, we have several ways on how we can summarize them numerically. Of course, the very basic, you can present the lowest and the highest value. You can present the measures of center or what we call as averages. Yung mean, yung median, yung mode. You can also describe their spread or their variability using the standard deviation, the variance, the range, the interquartal range, or the coefficient of variation. Later on, uh, let's have a review of the averages and the variation, specifically how do we interpret them. Okay? And of course, for numerical summaries of quantitative variables, we also have skewness. Ano po yung skewness? Recall natin from our basic stat, skewness is related to the shape of the distribution of our data. Meaning, if I plot the points, are the points symmetric? Or are the points concentrated on the low side of the axis or on the higher side of the axis? Okay? Of course, my visual way on how to do that, pero meron din naman pong numerical way on how to describe if your data is symmetric, if it has a longer tail on the right or a longer tail on the left. Okay? But again, there's also a numerical way through our coefficient of skewness. Now, for visual summaries, again, we have a lot. Your box plot okay, or your five number summary. Remember or recall po natin, yung box plot natin enables us to present five statistics right away. Minimum, maximum, the first quartile, the median, and the third quartile. So that means yung box plot also enables us to inspect the distribution of our data. Symmetric ba or skewed ba yung data natin? 
same objective is taken care of by the histogram. But please take note that the histogram should only be used for continuous data. Recall po natin yung histogram po, it's like your bar graph except that it has no spaces in between the bars. Okay? Kaya po no spaces kasi yung histogram intended siya to be used for continuous data. Then you also have your scatter plot. If you have two quantitative variables in which you want to inspect their potential relationship, you can use a scatter plot. For line chart, of course, we know from our basic stat that this is used for time series data. And now, because of the technology that we have, because of the variety of data that we can collect, we can also summarize our data using thematic maps. And that is if you want to display data from a specific geography. Now, let's review the numerical summaries that I have presented earlier. So let's start with the measures of center or averages. Now, pag sinabi nating average, hindi lang po yung nagpa-pertain sa arithmetic average na alam natin. That is yung sum of all observations divided by how many observations we have. Yung arithmetic average na yon, in statistics, we call it as mean. Okay? Pero yung average, pwede rin siya mag-pertain sa median. Recall that is the middle value of your array, meaning yung median separates yung upper and yung lower 50% ng array ng data natin. And of course, we have the mode. The mode is simply the value or the values that occurred most frequently in our data. Now, kung isipin natin, paano kaya natin ini-interpret yung mga measures of center na to? Sipin po natin, kaya siya tinawag na center, kasi siya yung point of balance. So ngayon, nandun na tayo sa concept ng point of balance, kung isipin natin CISO. Okay? CISO po. Okay? Pwede natin isipin that our measures of center is the full chrome of our CISO. So meaning, siya yung balancing point. Siya yung center ng distribution ng data set mo. So that means, in order to balance our CISO, we would often find the fulcrum not on the middle exactly, pwede rin naman siyang towards to the right or towards to the left, depending on the distribution of our data. Now, you might ask me, sir, how will we now determine which of these three should we incorporate in our discussion? Include ko po ba yung mean, yung median, yung mode, or lahat sila? Okay. Now, the answer is you should examine the distribution of your data to determine which among the three is the most appropriate to use. What do I mean by that? For mean, let us be aware that since the mean uses all the observations, the mean is heavily affected by extreme observations. Kung symmetric yung data natin, meaning my right balance between the low and high values, then there is no problem with using the mean. But for example, if you have an extreme observation, for example, an extremely high value, it will pull your mean towards that high value. And similarly, if you have an extremely low value, it will pull the mean towards that low value. So, if you have extreme observations, then the mean might not be a good choice to describe the center of your data. Now, for that case, if, they, if you have skewed distributions or distributions with outlier, it is best to uh, summarize your data using the median. And again, yung mode natin, it simply reflects the highest peak. So, so that's why sometimes yung mode, it's just rarely used to describe the center of your data. But the only advantage of the mode that is that it can also be used for qualitative data. 
Kasi ito lang naman po yung value that occurred most frequently. This does not involve any arithmetic operations. Now, when you have now described your average, you should also describe it or accompany it with a description of the variation or the spread of your observations. Meaning, you should also interpret a measure of variation. And as we have seen, there are a lot. Meron tayong variance, meron tayong standard deviation. Anong difference nilang dalawa? Yung variance, it comes in squared units. So for example, kung yung characteristic of interest in your study is measured in kilograms, your variance will come in squared kilograms. And in most cases, it will be very difficult to interpret squared units. Okay? That's why we come up with a measure of variation that comes in the original units of your observations. And that is your standard deviation. Kaya kung mapapansin nyo po, in some research papers, in most manuscripts, they interpret the standard deviation over the variance. Kasi mahirap isipin, gano'n ba kalaki yung squared units na yun? Gano'n ba kaliit yung squared units na yun? Okay? And take note that the standard deviation is always interpreted as the average distance of the observations from the mean. But warning, the standard deviation, it does not tell us that the range of our observations is always between one standard deviation away from the mean. Hindi siya laging mu minus plus the standard, or mean minus plus the standard deviation. Okay? Kaya tayo nag-incorporate ng term na average. Diba? On the average. Okay? When you collect several samples or when you collect another samples, it is possible that you will observe the same kind of deviation or difference from the mean. Okay? Now, in some cases, when your study involves the comparison of two or more groups in which it is possible that these groups have different means, they have different units of measurements, it is advised to use the coefficient of variation instead of the standard deviation. Okay? Why? Because the coefficient of variation is expressed in percentage. Okay? It does not come in the original units of measurement. Okay? Paano kinocompute yun? Recall natin, it's simply the standard deviation divided by the mean. And you express it in percentage. And again, Ang general rule lang natin sa lahat ng measures of variation natin, the higher the magnitude or the higher the value that you are able to compute, the greater the dispersion or the variability in your data. Alright, so I hope na-clarify natin yung mga numerical measures that we usually include in the discussion portion of our descriptive statistics. Now, before we conclude the discussion on this section, I'd like to provide you with some notes on visual summaries. But I also invite you to watch um, the webinar of LRC on data visualization, wherein I provided an in-depth discussion on the basic principles and applications of data visualization, not just in uh, writing manuscripts, but also in presentations. Okay? So in general, how do we uh, apply data visualizations for our data? Okay? But just a very quick reminder that whenever, when we, that whenever we are deciding which chart or visual summary to use given our data, we should always be guided by this first question. What do we want to show? Do we want to show comparisons? Do we want to show relationships? Do we want to show compositions? Or do we want to show distributions? And once you have an answer to that question, the next thing to do is to check 
which chart can be used based on the data that I have. So na present naman na natin kanina, for example, if you have time series data, an obvious choice is line chart. If you want to display frequencies, the obvious choice is bar chart. If you want to show relationships, the obvious choice is a scatter plot. Okay? So again, first question that we should answer, what do I want to show? Now, as a concluding remark for uh, the methods for summarizing our data numerically and visually, I'd like to remind you of the following uh, best practices in creating your charts. Number one, always be sure to label your axis. And when labeling your axis, you do not just include the variable being measured, but also the unit of measurement that you use for that characteristic. Second, start the frequency or percentage axis baseline at zero if necessary. This is very applicable in the case of the bar chart because we always think that the heights of the bars are proportional to the magnitudes being presented. Okay? So if we see that one bar is half the size of the other, we would, we would normally think that there is a 50% difference. So that difference should actually or properly visualized in your bar chart by, of course, starting your baseline at zero. Third, maintain a constant scale for the axis. This tip is very applicable for line charts. Take note, in data visualization, we do not compare apples with oranges. That means if you are graphing time series data, if you are showing data monthly, you should be consistent from month one to month to up to the last month point. If you are showing annual data, dapat consistent din po tayo na dapat lahat yon ay yearly data. Okay? Aside from that, dapat consistent din tayo dun sa spacing. Kung one month yung difference nung sa line chart natin, dapat consistent yon all throughout. Kung two years yung difference, dapat consistent din po yon all throughout. Next is avoid chart dump. Okay? Huwag po tayo masyado magtitiwala doon sa mga um, preset na templates sa Excel lalo na yung mga nakita natin may mga shadows, okay? may mga fill patterns, may mga gradient backgrounds. Take note, again, our main objective or main goal of visualizing our data is that we want information to be easily understood. Charts are not decorations. Charts should convey information. And lastly, Say no to 3D charts. We have um, seen in several instances that 3D charts can sometimes be misleading. And I hope nandito tayo ng discussion sa ethics ng research. So, of course, it is our duty as a researcher to always show the right information. Okay? Kasi po, minsan, pag nagpapakita tayo ng 3D charts, nagkakaroon na po ng distortion of information. Okay? So, again, if you are much more interested in learning about data visualization, specifically some of the best practices in using each of the charts that we commonly use, um, I think the recording is available in NRC's Facebook and YouTube page. All right. So, I hope um okay pa po tayo. So, we still have one remaining topic and I think this will be the more interesting topic because we now come to the inferential statistics portion of our webinar. Meaning, ano kaya yung mga tools na usually ginagamit natin to uh, describe our data based from the sample and eventually conclude it to the population. But as I have mentioned, for this one, I, pre I preferred to discuss the common misconceptions in inferential statistics. Okay? Now, to just to give you an idea, 
bakit important na dinidiscuss natin yung misconceptions in inferential statistics? So I give you one minute to study this illustration. So this illustration shows four people or four individuals talking about their idea or their perception why the glass becomes wet. So meron tayong baso dito na merong yellow. So they were interested on the phenomenon that happened with this material or with this object. Tulang ko po kayo, zoom natin. Okay, so after inspecting the illustration, um, invite ko po kayo sa comment section. Alin kaya dito yung, alin between student A, B, C, or D yung nagsabi ng tama? So, mas based on your knowledge in science, tama ba yung sinabi ni student A, ni student B, ni student C, or ni student D? Now, whatever your answer is, take note that in this illustration, what happened is that we are looking at one phenomenon or one concept, but four individuals have varied interpretations of what has just happened. So one has a correct interpretation, while three have misconceptions on the phenomenon that happened with regard to the object being inspected. So nagamit na natin yung term na misconception. So technically, misconception is defined as a wrong belief or opinion as a result of not fully understanding a concept. In statistics, and dami pong mga misconceptions because it is rooted on the idea that most statistical concepts are interrelated. I would like to think that it stems from, of course, yung experience natin with basic statistics. Kung paano natin siya natutunan. So, di ba, ideally, yung statistics, tinuturo sa atin ng teacher yung statistical concepts in a logical sequence. Magsa-start yan with basic concepts, katulad ng ginawa natin kanina. Basic concepts, dinifferentiate yung mga areas ng statistics, and so on and so forth. But if you were not able to fully pay attention to all the pieces of information presented to you, your learning might be fragmented, which in turn will result to a partial understanding of that topic. And if you were not able to fully understand that topic, then you might now have some misconceptions about several statistical concepts. Now, ang goal ko po dito ngayon when, uh, in discussing the statistical tools that we usually use for inferential statistics, let us spot out these components and reinforce the correct idea that we should use in analyzing and interpreting our data. Right? So first, misconception. Yeah, very popular the Slovin's formula. Misconception number one. Sabi nila, the Slovin's formula can be applied to any sampling problem. Okay? Take note po ha, baka lang ma-misquote ako dito. Yung binabasa ko po ay misconception. Okay? Hindi ibig sabihin po, tama yung sinabi ko ha. Misconception po itong sinasabi ko. 
Okay? And we will this and we will uh, explore later on how we will correct this misconception. Okay? First, okay, side cuento lang po. Actually, it is not proper to call it Slovenes kasi hindi naman po talaga si Slovene yung nag-develop ng formula. Okay? Pero sa jang sumikat na lang siya at tinawag na po siyang Slovene's formula. Okay? Now, let's discuss this. Ang sabi po nung iba, yung Slovene's formula daw po can be applied to any sampling problem. Meaning, regardless kung ano daw yung method mo, kung ano yung sampling procedure mo, kung ano yung nature ng population mo, pwede mo daw gamitin yung Slovene's formula sa pag-compute ng sample size. Tama kaya yon? Take note po, in several studies, uh, it was already shown that the Slovene's formula is applicable only when your parameter or your characteristic of interest involves the proportion. Okay? Meaning proportion of a certain characteristic of interest yung gusto mong i-compute based from your sample and eventually conclude to the population. Next, it is only applicable if your confidence coefficient is set to 95%. Take note that in reality, we can set confidence levels at varied numbers. Pwede siyang 90%, pwede siyang 99%, depende sa iyo yun as a researcher. Of course, meron yung effect. May effect kapag ini-increase natin yung confidence coefficient, may effect yun sa sample size. Pag nag-increase tayo ng confidence level, nag-increase din yung sample size na. Okay? So, lagi siyang may trade-off. Next, it is also applicable, only applicable, when your hypothesized proportion is 0.5. That is, you are claiming that the proportion of the characteristic of interest among the units in the population is 50%. And lastly, it is applicable only when the sampling method is simple random sampling or methods that are shown statistically to be more efficient than the simple random sampling. Okay po. So, having said that, as a researcher, to check po natin, did we satisfy all of these conditions? If yes, then you can use the Slovene's formula. If not, then, mind you, there are several formulas for computing the sample size. And aside from that, hindi lang naman po ito yung consideration natin for computing the sample size. We should also consider the resources that we have. Kasi pag ako, nag-compute ako ng sample size sa study mo, tapos sabihin ko ganito kalaki, kaya mo ba? Kaya ba ng time natin? Kaya ba ng resources natin? Otherwise, yeah, adjust natin. Bababaan natin yung confidence level, bababaan natin yung margin of error in order, or tataasan natin yung margin of error in order to uh, accommodate your request of having limited resources. So, again, kasi aware po ako na meron tayong website for computing sample sizes and that website uses the Slovene's formula. Okay? So again, parang pie chart lang to. Most popular yet most misused. Misconception number two. On confidence intervals. Sabi nila, the confidence level is the probability that the parameter of interest will fall somewhere between the endpoints of the interval. So first, recall muna natin. Tama ba itong ganitong interpretation? In statistics, there are two types of estimators. We have your point estimator. As the name implies, we come up with only a single value. So yan po yung nakikita natin sa mga manuscripts na sample mean, sample standard deviation, sample proportions. But we also have interval estimators. Instead of a single value, we provide a range of values that we hope this range of values contains the true value coming from our population. Now, one specific type of interval estimator is what we call as the confidence interval estimator. And basically, when we say confidence interval, we attach a level of confidence. Okay? Meaning, 
that confidence level is the percentage of time, we expect that the method that we use to produce that interval contains the parameter of interest. Let's have an example. The 95% confidence interval for the true mean mileage an automobile is driven annually in EDSA is between 22,735.6 and 24,264.4 kilometers. People, some people would sometimes interpret it using this guide. Sabi nila, there is a 95% chance that the true mean mileage an automobile is driven annually in EDSA is between these two numbers. Take note that this is incorrect. Okay. Again, we would never know the chance that the true value of your characteristic of interest is between your confidence interval. Bakit po hindi natin malalaman yun? Again, we are working with the assumption that characteristics from your population are unknown. Hindi natin alam. Wala tayong information sa true mean, true standard deviation, or true proportion. Kasi kung meron, bakit pa tayo nag-sample? Diba? Nakakuha niyo po yung logic. Kaya tayo nagsasample kasi hindi natin alam yung karakteristik ng population. Consequently, if we will compute confidence intervals, we would also not know the percentage chance that the true value will be within that interval. Okay? Next, another interpretation. Sabi nila, the true mean mileage an automobile is driven annually in EDSA will fall between these numbers about 95% of the time. Again, this is wrong. Same idea po nung kanina. The confidence interval only tells us the chance that a yet-to-be-constructed interval contains the parameter value. It does not tell us that an interval that was already constructed has this certain chance for probability. Now, the proper way to interpret our confidence intervals is saying that we are 95%, that the true value is between this interval. So for example, meron tayong situation that says the 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of UPLB undergraduate students who complete their degree on time is between 0.65 and 0.8. So we actually interpret it using this guide. Okay. Now, again, ang guiding principle natin, if we will go back to our previous example, a 95% level of confidence only means that about 95% of the nine, of the confidence intervals calculated from the different random samples will contain the true population value. Now, as a final remark regarding confidence intervals, iwan ko po sa inyo itong illustration that is an evidence of what we are discussing a while ago. So, let us assume na meron po tayong population in which Yung mean niya is described by the middle of this curve. And it's described by this line. Okay? For illustration purposes, sabihin na natin, alam natin yung true mean. Okay? Ngayon, yung confidence interval natin, yeah. So, kita po natin that whenever we simulate this process, okay, we would see that yung confidence intervals natin, some would capture the true mean, some would not. And if we will perform sampling repeatedly, so medyo theoretical basis na to ng confidence interval, may kita natin that 95% or almost 95% of these intervals contained the true mean. Next, misconception number three on statistical hypothesis. People say that the statistical hypothesis is a claim or statement about the statistic of interest. For example, 
An electrical firm claims that the light bulbs they manufacture have a lifetime of 800 hours on the average. So, sabi daw, ganito daw natin ipo-formulate yung null and alternative hypothesis. The sample mean is 800 versus the sample mean is not equal to 800. Take note, this is a wrong formulation of statistical hypothesis. Bakit po? Recall that your statistical hypothesis is a claim or statement about the parameter of interest. Okay? Again, guided tayo by the principle that we are performing hypothesis testing because we are validating a claim about the population. So that's why it is more appropriate to formulate your hypothesis by using the parameters. So for example, for the mean, ang notation po natin for the parameter is the Greek letter mu. Next. Number four, still on statistical hypothesis, people say that the researcher's hypothesis is always the alternative hypothesis. Still on the same example, take note that from our basic stat, we have this definition that the null hypothesis is a statement of equality. Kaya nga po siya tinawag na null. Hypothesis. Diba? Kasi pag sinabi nating null, status quo, it is a statement of equality, no change, no effect, no difference. So therefore, your null hypothesis should always possess that quality symbol. And nakita natin from our example, yan yung claim ko, that the mean is equal to 800. Pero hindi ko siya nilagay sa HA. Kasi misconception yon Hindi naman po laging yung researcher's hypothesis ay yung alternative hypothesis na. Okay? And always take note that your alternative hypothesis and null hypothesis should be contradictory. So that's why we will formulate our alternative hypothesis to use the not equal sign. Now, review lang po natin. If your claim is in the null hypothesis, and if it says that you should use the equal sign, ang contradiction po nun sa HA, ang gagamitin natin, not equal. Kung yung claim mo, nagsasabi na greater than or equal, yung test natin, yung HA mo will be, not, will be less than equal. And if your claim is less than or equal, susulat so natin yun sa HO, and ang katandem po nun is greater than. But for example, if our claim is in HA, halimbawa po, not equal yung claim natin, automatic, equal po yung ating null hypothesis. Kapag yung claim natin ay less than, nasa HA dapat yon, pero yung null hypothesis natin, tick tayo sa equality. And if your claim is greater than, tulad po natin yun sa HA, pero still, our null hypothesis is equal. So kung isipin natin, yung less than or equal, yung greater than or equal sa HO, special cases lang po ng claim. That is, kung yun talaga yung claim natin for our um, study. Next, misconception number five, on stating the decision, we accept the null hypothesis if the alternative hypothesis cannot be supported. Now, let us recall that in statistical hypothesis testing, we have two decisions. It's either we reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. If we reject the null hypothesis, we simply say that there is sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Pag sinabi naman po natin fail to reject the null hypothesis, we say that there is no sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. If we did not reject the null hypothesis, okay, hindi po ibig sabihin nun that we 
accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay? Ano pong ibig sabihin nun? Ang analogy po natin sa statistical hypothesis testing is the judiciary system, at least in the Philippines. Courtroom analogy po. Tingnan natin yung parallelism ng dalawang concept. Note that in the courtroom, we always assume that a person is innocent. Correct? Now, in statistical hypothesis, yun po yung equivalent ng null hypothesis. Bakit yun po? Because in reality, it is more practical, it is much safer to assume equality. Kasi ang ibig sabihin ng null hypothesis, walang naging effect, walang naging change, walang naging difference. So it is synonymous with saying that the person is innocent. And then, yung alternative hypothesis naman natin, ang equivalent niya doon sa courtroom analogy natin, the person is guilty. But take note, in our judiciary system, iba, ang ginagawa po natin is that we find evidence na, na ano pong naalala natin? In our courtroom analogy, we find evidence to prove that the person is guilty. Diba? Kaya nga yung term na ginagamit, diba? guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Diba? Ibig sabihin, may sufficient evidence tayo to say that the person is guilty. Alright? So, means that also, yung reject the non-hypothesis decision natin in statistical hypothesis testing, it is equivalent to the guilty verdict. We have sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. On the other hand, pag sinabi naman nating fail to reject HO, that is equivalent to the not guilty verdict. Okay? Ibig sabihin, we lack sufficient evidence. We lack the evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Okay? And finally, misconception number six on p-values, people would say that smaller p-values indicate a bigger effect. For example, in this study, which the average work week of newly hired employees was claimed to be longer than 40 hours and a p-value of 0 0.01 was obtained, some people would interpret it as there is a 1% chance that the null hypothesis is true. Do we really interpret the p-value this way? Take note that this is incorrect. Because in statistical hypothesis testing, nakita po natin dun sa courtroom analogy natin especially, that we always assume that the null hypothesis is true. Diba? Ulit, babalik tayo sa courtroom analogy natin. Diba? Ang ating pinangahawakan na principle doon is that the person is innocent. So dito din, the null hypothesis is true. Okay? So that p-value, we should always remember, it is not a hypothesis probability. In fact, in reality, it may actually be far. Okay? If we have information about our true population value. Okay? Now, ano bang ibig sabihin itong 0 0.01? Take note, this p-value simply indicates the degree to which our collected data conforms to the pattern that is expected or predicted by our statistical hypothesis. For example, yung 1% p-value, it simply indicates that our data is not very close to the statistical model that is predicted by our method. Another interpretation, people would say that given this p-value, sabihin nila, if the study is repeated a number of times, you would obtain the same results or even better results 99% of the time. Again, this is wrong. Specifically, this pertains to the replication fallacy of the p-value. 
Anong ibig sabihin nun? We do not interpret the p-value as the complement of the proportion of significant results when we perform our study several times. Always take note that you can have different results every time you collect different samples. So that means you will always have different p-values. So, the principle natin is that you should always remember that the p-value does not measure anything about the effect or size of the difference that we have observed. Okay? Sinasabi lang natin that if we were able to obtain a low p-value, it simply indicates that the outcome okay, that we obtain from our sample or something that would be more extreme would be very unlikely if our null hypothesis is true. So, simple lang ang paggamit natin ng p-value. Wag po natin siyang overcomplicate. Yung p-value will simply indicate whether to reject or not to reject your null hypothesis. Do we have sufficient or insufficient evidence to support your alternative hypothesis? All right. So, I hope I cleared things up. Okay. To po yung mga common misconceptions na encounter natin, not just from researcher but also from students, di ba? I'm sure bakay iba sa inyo nagkaroon ng light bulb moment. May ah, mali pala yung interpretation na naalala ko. Okay? Mali pala yung idea na naalala ko with regard to this statistical concept. Okay? Because at the end of the day, if you assuming that you have properly used the statistical tool for your study, but you have interpreted it the wrong way, mali pa din po. Tama? So you are still providing your readers or your intended audience incorrect information from your study. Okay? So again, if you have further questions regarding the statistical tools that you can use for from your study for your study, um, we have or the LRC has a webinar series on the statistical tools commonly used in researches. So may three webinar series, may three webinar sessions po tayo doon. One is on experimental designs. The other is on the parametric and non-parametric tests. And the other is on correlation and regression. Okay? But still, I hope I was able to provide you with information specifically on how you will package the results and discussion part of your manuscript. And to end my discussion, I would like to leave, the, leave you with this statement that always remember that statistics is a toolbox. It's not enough that you can recognize the tool. It's not enough that you know t-test, that you know ANOVA, that you know correlation, that you know regression. Okay? What is more important is that you know when and how to use that tool. Okay? Ni porket na encounter natin sa isang study, ano ba yung ginamit nun, yun din yung gagamitin natin. Because let's check if you can really apply that certain statistical tool given the nature of your data, given the goal or objective that you have for your study. Okay? So thank you very much, and I hope you learned something after or um after listening to this session. And I think we still have time to address a few questions or clarifications regarding this session. So maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Sir Enzo. No, that's a very enlightening topic for for this morning. At least na marami pong Feel ko marami pong nagkaroon sir ng aha moments sa kanilang mga sa mga studies especially for our participants doon po sa example na pre-provide niyo po no na yung si letter D yung student na may tamang interpretation. So marami po sir nagpapasalamat kanina pa po sa chat sec sa comment section no. Very ano daw po very enlightening po kayo na mag-explain na mga gitong complex na topic just like sa, sa statistics po. So uh, we have a first question po, sir. I'm not sure kung ano pinapartin niya po, pero from Rene Okendo po. Ang question niya is, 
what can we do alternatively when the proportions are not stated in existing literatures or documents? I think this has something to do with yung kaninang na-mention niya, sir. Hmm. Uh -huh. Sample size computation. That's a very good question. Yan. So, may onting background yung nagtanong. Kasi po, pag nagkakompute po tayo ng sample size, your statistician would sometimes ask you, what is your hypothesized proportion? What is your hypothesized variation? And we would usually respond to them as, look at related literatures. Ano po yung nakita nilang proportion? Ano yung nakita nilang variation? But if ever you do not have information on that, specifically sa proportion, ang conservative estimate po ng hypothesized proportion natin would be 0. Point. Because that, um, that hypothesized value will give you the most conservative sample size and at the same time, the most conservative estimate of the variation that you have from your popular. So 0. 0.5. Thank you, sir. And so at least, ano, na-clarify po yung concern po nung student po, no? So, uh, another question po, sir, uh, from Severino Salvador. Ang question niya po is, just want to confirm of a response given by a researcher who used non-probability sampling but used Slovin's formula to determine the sample size. Ano pong take niyo doon, sir? Mm -hmm. Sorry, ako personally, kapag non-probability samples po yung ginagamit, di na po ako nagko-compute ng sample size. Hindi ko na ginagamit like for example in Slovins kasi po wala naman tayong aim to make inferences about the population. Okay? Kasi take note, yung mga sample sizes natin for, uh, yung mga formulas natin for computing the sample size will provide us information on the confidence level, on the margin of error, which we do not use if we do not aim to make inferences about the population. Thank you, Sir Enzo. At, uh, so I hope na sagot ni Sir Enzo. Yung... I guess, Sir. Sige po. Saka, sabi ko nga po kanina, may iba't ibang formula for computing the sample size. Mm -hmm. In fact, meron nga pong base lang sa percentage ng population. Eh. Diba? So, for example, 10% ng population, 20% ng population, pero may drawback yun. Kasi kung ganun lang yung way mo on computing the sample size, assuming na probability samples yung makukuha mo, wala kang objective measure nung precision ng estimates na makukuha. Okay? And yung precision na yon very important yon whenever you are establishing yung validity or accuracy ng results na nakuha. Thank you, sir. Ito, sir, ano? Kini ko, sir, ano? Ang dami pong ano? Ang dami pong fans sa ating comment section. <laughs> Thank you, daw po. I, I think these are some participants, sir, na umaten po ng ating previous stats session si kasi may mga nakita akong comments po dito ano ba yun yes another ano stats session with sir and so so i believe naka-attend po sila sir nung ano nung ating making sense of data tapos yung ating one stat at a time so tayo yung nagkita-kita muli mga kaibigan first viewer nandun sila sa very first webinar ng LRC yes exactly sir no so trivia yun guys ang very first webinar ng Learning Resource Center was yung kay Sir Enzo on making sense of data. So, diba? Very, ano, very fruitful and ano, memorable. Very nostalgic, sir, kung maalala mo. Parang ano, mga, parang, parang ganitong times din yun, sir, yung mga simula ng semester po, ano. So, eto po. Eto po, sir, eto, hindi siya about sa sa numbers exactly, pero ang may question po si Bert Padilla, eto, at medyo, ano, Parang ano, ang, uh, galing sa puso yung question niya. Sabi niya po, ay tanong niya po, bakit po mahalaga ang paggamit ng mga statistical hypothesis sa mga research? Ano po ba ang maipapayan niyo sa mga first time researchers kagaya niya? Importance daw sa ng statistical hypothesis for first time researchers. So, I think babalik po tayo dun sa concept ng hindi lang naman po inferential yung statistics. Meron din pong descriptive statistics. And tatanggalin natin yung notion natin na yung inferential statistics lagi siyang superior over, over descriptive statistics. Kasi yung ibang researchers, pag nagko-consult sila sa akin, tapos non-probability yung samples nila, sasabihin nila, sasabihin ko, sorry po, pero descriptive statistics lang yung kayang nating magawa dito. 
malulungkot sila. Okay? They would think that yung research nila would be of less value over the other. Pero hindi po ganun. Okay? Take note that um, yung research natin, yung contribution niya, hindi siya na measure by the complexity of the statistical tool that we used. It is the information that can be contributed for the greater good. Diba? So kahit nag-compute lang ako ng ninjaan, kahit nag-visualize lang ako using a bar graph, pero malaki yung impact ng information na nakuha natin from your research, then important pa din siya. Diba? Talaga, treasure mo pa rin yung result niya. So to answer yung question naman na how important is statistical hypothesis, again, we would uh, go back to the definition na kaya tayo nag-hypothesis testing is because we only have information from the sample. And we want to make conclusions about the population. And again, babalik ulit tayo doon sa idea, bakit tayo nag-sample? Kasi hindi natin kayang kunin lahat ng units sa population. Kasi kulang tayo ng resources, kulang tayo ng time. Kasi masyadong malaki yung population, kaya tayo nag-sample. Okay? And yung last question, aside from doon sa importance ng hypothesis testing, anong mapapayo ko po sa mga first-time researchers? Consult statisticians not only during the analysis phase, but most importantly, in the design phase. Kung magsasurvey po kayo, consult kayo kay statistician. Tama ba yung sampling method mo? Appropriate ba yung sample size mo? Kung mag-experiment ka, tama ba yung layout ng experiment mo? Na-consider mo ba lahat ng nuisance factors and so on? Yan lang. Thank you, Sir Enzo. And ano po, Sir, that's a very good reminder. Kasi usually ang perception po ng ating mga young researchers po, no, they consult the, the statistician pag nandiyan na yung data nila. Ay, hindi yung prior pa nun na nagkulit, tapos kalalabasan, mali pala yung nagamit nila na instrument or yung mga ganong factor. So very good, ano po, Sir, very good point po yung na-mention nyo na consult with your statisticians even during the design phase. Kasi, Saka, yes sir, sige po. Sige, sige sir. Ano sige po siya? Sige sir. Okay. Saka, I would also like to say to the researchers, not just to the young researchers, that yung role po ng statistician ngayon ay hindi na lang siya yung clinic type. Hindi na lang siya yung pag may problem yung researcher, saka magkoconsult sa statistician. Ang role na po ngayon ng statistician is also a collaborator. Okay? So, hindi na lang tayo statistical consultancy. Statistical collaboration na po tayo. So sana yung researchers recognize din natin yung role ng statisticians doon sa research assistant. Yes sir. Kasi minsan may mga researchers parang sila yung nag sila pa yung nagdidictate sa statisticians kung paano man ano pa paano pa madodraw out yung ano yung interpretation sa data where it would be contrary dun sa nagawa niya sa kanyang ano sa kanyang methodology. So, I, I agree, sir, very much na it is important to consult with your statisticians, especially during your the conceptualization of your research design. Which leads me pala, sir, naalala ko bigla. Binunod ko yung thesis ko sa aking, sa aking ano, sa, dito sa bookcase namin. Naalala ko, sir, yung ginamit ko na statistical analysis doon. Sabi ko si assignment ko kanina. Eh. Is nagano po ako, nag-weighted means and median tapos yung yun yung po yung descriptive tapos yung aking inferential statistics na ginamit po natin po sir if I, if I recall correct itong Spearman's test of association pati yung Pearson sky square so ano talaga sir it would based parang may nakita din po yung question kanina ang tanong niya po is eto which leads me pala sir to this question paano po pag paano po ba kapag both qualitative and quantitative ang thesis ko po. Ano po magiging research design ko? Parang ito po yung tanong niya, sir. Ni Abel Andes. Sige, sir. Masasagot din siguro yan ni Sir JM tomorrow. Pero um, actually, sa generally, it's always best to do both results. Okay? Pero yung practical interpretations, yung mga particular questions on bakit nagkaganito, anong implication nito, usually nasasagot yun ng qualitative research. So, both. So, parehas po ay pwedeng-pwede natin gamitin for our research. So, tryang, ito-triangulate natin lahat. Hmm. Parang mas ano nga, sir, kapag 
parang both mo ginamit, mas ano eh, mas mas magiging reliable yung data at mas malig, malawak yung breath ng nasakop ng study mo. Mas marami ka pang ma, pwedeng ma-interpret na data to help uh, ano po yon add spice or ano, <laughs> add highlights to your research. So, Correct. thank you for Kasi that, sir. Tatandaan na yung statistical tools natin will only provide, that, provide us with technical interpretation, yung statistical interpretation. Yung practical interpretation na kay researcher yon. Pero kung hirap siya doon sa practical interpretation, Ayan, sir. Sige po, sir. Naputol pa ata kanina. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sige pa. Sige, sir. Sana ko naputol pa part. Sorry. Yun doon po, sir. Yung sa... <laughs> na, nawala na yung sa... <laughs> Siguro, sir. Yun doon po sa... I mean, Sige, sir. I mean, same idea pa din po. Uh-huh. So, yung practical interpretations, if the researcher finds it difficult to extract from the quantitative part, balik, uh, seek time na help. doon sa qualitative part ng research na. Thank you, Sir Enzo. Uh, ito po, Sir, I think this is from a teacher po kasi I think he's... Ito po yung question niya from Ito Serizawa. In teaching research and statistics, what visualiz- visualization tools or simulations can be used to help students visualize statistical realities as they relate to computations and interpretations? Your thoughts, Sir, as a stat teacher po. Mm-mm. Alam nyo, meron, um, kailangan ko pa siyang hanapin. Check ko lang kung nasa bookmarks ko siya. Pero merong website that, marami pong website that would actually show visually yung mga concepts kanina. Like yung confidence intervals, even probability concepts. Meron tayo yung website para doon. Uh, try ko lang pong hanapin. Pag nahanap ko po, ilagay ko po sa comment sections. Comment section. Pero, um, ayun po natin hanapin. Meron po ako na-encounter na ganun. Probability and inferential stat concepts. Makatulong talaga yon for um, discussion of concepts related to uh, probability and statistics. Try ko po hanapin. Tapos, bigay ko po sa inyo yun. Sige po, Sir Enzo. Uh, next question po, sir, from Erwin Ortiz. Can we use the Rausoff calculator in determining the sample size? I don't know kung, ano yun, sorry, R- Rausoff calculator? I don't know. I'm not familiar po. Eh. Ko po, ha? Yep. Mm. Real time po natin, ano, i-check. <laughs> First time ko lang din po kasi na-encounter itong Rausoff. Mm-hmm. Meron naman siyang about the margin of error, the confidence level, the population size. I think ang kailangan lang po nating i-verify sa documentation nitong website na to is if it assumes what sampling method. Okay? So especially aside from the sampling method, pati po yung um, parameter of interest natin dito. Because most of the online sample size calculator that I have encountered assumes proportion as your parameter of interest. Pero hindi po kasi laging proportion yung parameter of interest natin sa study. So kung mean po, iba po yung formula po na ginagamit natin. Sige po, sir. Thank you po for that. Siguro po, sir, no? uh, we'll accommodate last three questions po natin. Uh, from Alvin po, ang question niya po, sir, is, uh, I think he is a teacher po ng, ano, ng stat or research. May I ask if there is a difference between correlation and association? I have noticed that there are some students interpreting correlation using the word association. Sir, sir Enzo? Good question po. Pwede po nating isipin na yung association ay pwede subcategory niya ay correlation. Kasi pag sinabi po natin correlation, it only refers to linear associations. Pero pag sinabi po natin association, it can refer to linear associations, 
and other polynomials po polynomial associations na present sa ating data. Thank you Sir Enzo for ano for clarifying that po no. Ah, uh, po Sir, uh, wait, let me see yung question. Ah, ito po Sir. Uh, from Aris Luciana, clarification po is Likert scale ordinal po? I have seen other researchers use parametric statistics to analyze the result. Tama po ba ito, Sir Enzo? I remember meron din po tayong session na naging um, mainit po ang ating discussion dito sa Likert scale. Okay? So we should, as statisticians, we also recognize that there are um, evidences that, all, that can support the idea that Likert scales can translate into quantitative values. Okay? Ang opinion ko po dito is that ano bang nature ng quantitative variable? Diba? Ang nature po ng quantitative variable, alam ko na yung difference between 1 and 2 ay same lang sa difference ng between 2 and 3, 3 and 4, 4 and 5, and so on. So meaning consistent yung gap nila or consistent yung scale. Now, if you want to convert your Likert scale to quantitative, do you have the similar property? Diba? Yung level 1 po ba, same yung distance niya sa level 2? Yung level 2, same ba yung distance niya sa level 3? And so on. Because if you can assume that, then we have no problem with um, treating your Likert scale into quantitative. At sabi nga po, di ba sa previous sessions natin, again, Nandito po yung role na related literature. Kasi kailangan ma-back up po natin with um, reliable evidence okay, na valid po yung ginagawa nating conversion from Likert to quantity. Thank you for that, Sir Enzo. So dito natin makita talaga sa ating mga, part sa ating mga participants na related yung ating mga sessions for this webinar series. So, and emphasize ni Sir Enzo na it's important to have reliable sources in yung literature review na, mapagba, na pwede nyo pagbasehan in making those uh, claims or moves sa inyong research. Ito po, Sir. Actually, ilang questions na lang po to, pero I think we can accommodate them. Baka hindi sila makatulog kapag hindi po natin nasagot ang tanong nila. Ito po, Sir. From Rainiel Anunapon, sa single case studies design po, Paano po masasabi na yung number of informants mo ay valid na considering an inclusion criteria? Single case study design daw po, sir. Paano po masasabi na ang number of informants ay valid considering an inclusion criteria? If I'm not mistaken, di ba yung case studies natin usually does not have that goal of concluding to the population? Correct? So kung, may, kung wala tayong goal, I think um, it will just be dependent on you as a researcher and a review of related literature kung yung number of informants natin for your case study is sufficient to um, uh, accurately and reliably describe the results of your study. So similar lang din po yan sa mga ibang mga um, tools na ginagamit natin sa stat. Like for example, I don't know if some of you have, have already heard of reliability testing sa mga questionnaires. There's not actually a single rule that says that you should collect this number of units in order to perform reliability testing. Ang nagiging basis na lang po usually, may mga studies, may mga researchers na nagko-conduct na theoretically napapakita nila na pag ganito yung sample size, pag ganito yung number of units na na-consider, nagiging stable yung estimates, accurate yung estimates, reliable yung estimates. So for that scenario, I would um, encourage you to check if there are studies that say that yung number of informants na yun would be sufficient to uh, produce reliable results for your study. Thank you, Sir Enzo. Proceed pa tayo sa next question from Regina's Sabi niya po, I am still confused with the interpretation of the p-value. If the p-value is greater than or less than 0 0.05, whether to say accept H or reject H, please enlighten me po, sir. 
parang regards po sa p-value, sir, I think confused pa po si participant. Okay. So first, dami nating issues na kailangan i-address doon sa question. Una po, yung 0.05. Take note that the 0.05 is not a magic number. Hindi po siya laging 0.05. Ano ba yung 0.05 doon sa interpretation na yun? That is your level of significance. So based from our basic stat, di ba alam natin na yung level of significance, pwede siyang 1%, pwede siyang 10%. Depende sa kung gano'ng kalaking error yung willing tayo i-accommodate for your study. Okay? So, ibig sabihin po, um, whenever we are writing our study, dapat hindi tayo matik na 0.05 ha. So, i-consider po natin kung ano yung level of significance na appropriate gamitin for our study. Second, sa decision rule po, simple lang po. If your p-value is low or is said to be less than your level of significance, we reject your null hypothesis. Otherwise, we fail to reject your null hypothesis. Tingin ko po, nakoconfuse lang po tayo doon sa idea na sinabi ko kanina na pag sinabi po nating fail to reject HO, hindi po natin sinasabing accept HO. Okay? So again, ang idea lang po nun is again sa courtroom analogy. Pag tayo ay nagbigay ng not guilty verdict, hindi natin sinasabi that the person is totally innocent. Ang sinasabi lang natin is that we lack evidence to say that the person is guilty beyond reasonable doubt. So ganun din po. If we fail to reject HO, we do not necessarily say that the non-hypothesis is true. We are just saying that we lack evidence to support the claim that we put under the alternative hypothesis. Kasi tatandaan po natin, yung results ng hypothesis testing, hindi siya absolute. Kasi pwedeng mag-collect ako ng sample, mag-collect si Josh ng sample, and we can arrive at different results. Kasi po, rely, uh, dependent siya doon sa quality ng sample na makukuha po. Thank you, sir. And so, to, so talagang ano, kailangan mong i-double check or i- I, tawag dito, i-review with regards dun sa ating hypothesis. Good point yun, sir, na kasi akala talaga ng iba na pag na-fail to reject HO, ay ganun na interpretation niya. Parang nga siyang yung ano, yung, yung uh, kung i-visualize mo nga, parang nga siyang courtroom na hindi big sabihin na ay not guilty ka, totally wala kang ano, wala kang, hindi ka at fault in any way, parang ganun. So parang ganun din ang ating paggamit na hypothesis. So, thank you, sir. Ito po, sir. Last two na po siguro. Last two na po na questions. Ito po, sir. I think uh, uh, ito. Ang question ni Daryl Lapus, Good morning, sir. May minimum number po ba sa sample size ng descriptive statistics or research? Mayroon po kasing naglalagay na at least 100 po regardless kung proportional sa population or hindi. I think, sir, this is with regards sa validity na research with regards sa sample na ginamit niya. Meron ba po tayong guidelines sa statistics with regards sa minimum number of sample size? I think this is related po sir sa mga nagpapa-survey, sa mga research. Ano pong take niyo dito, sir? Kung descriptive stat, of course, it will be dependent on several factors. Like for example, kung may aim ka na i-compare yung mga groups, E eh di dapat, meron po tayong at least two representatives sa bawat groups. Bakit ko po sinabi yung at least two? Kasi paano tayo magkakaroon ng source of variation kung isa lang yung unit na nakuha natin sa group? Okay? Aside from that, of course, babalik tayo sa resources. Kasi kung sabihin dyang 1,000, may time ka ba? May pera ka ba? Para mag-collect ng information doon sa 1,000. So, again, tingnan natin yung 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 Reference ba na nagsabing at least 100, reliable po ba yun? Ano yung naging evidence niya para sabihin that 100 is a good number for producing your descriptive statistics? Thank you, Sir Enzo. So, actually, Sir, ano, madami pa pong ano, questions dito, but I will only choose one last point. Siguro po, Sir Enzo, you can ano, po, check on these questions later on na lang po, no? since we have a limited time na rin po. Ito po, sir, from a statistician's point of view po, ang question ni Ito Sarizawa po is, how can we ensure that the data obtained from questionnaires are not just guesswork from respondents? 
how can we ensure the integrity and reliability of responses? Ano pong ano nyo dyan, sir? Kate, nyo Sorry, Josh. Are not, yung unang sentence, are not um, guess? Tama ba? Are not guess, guess work? Parang hindi hmm. hinulaan lang po siguro ng respondents. Parang, ang question ang question po siguro ni part ni participant is parang paano po natin ma-ensure ang integrity and reliability ng ating mga responses from our research o yung nag-gather na po natin na data. Sige po, sir. From a statistician's point of view. <laughs> Very good. Para tuloy feeling ko, ano na, election service yung dinidiscuss. Anyway, ang idea po kasi nakita natin ngayon na yung survey is not just about computing the sample size. Surveys are also about the operations or the fieldwork itself. So, paano natin ma-assure na yung responses ay accurate, yung responses ay true? Una, yung questionnaire natin. Dapat properly formulated, properly worded yung questionnaire natin. Iiwasan natin yung mga leading questions, yung mga double-barreled questions, and so on. Second, yung mismong interviewer natin or enumerator. Okay? Uh, I would always remind my students in dun sa survey operations class namin na yung behavior ng enumerator can influence the response of the respondents. Halimbawa, nagsagot siya, tapos bigla kang napag-react na, ha? Ganyan. <laughs> Bakit? Mga ganon. So, iniiwasan yon, kasi dapat properly trained po yung enumerators natin to be, pwede natin sabihin poker face, di ba? Dapat hindi, as he or she records the responses, dapat Remain, he or she also remains objective. So it all boils down to the proper training of your enumerators. Okay, so again, it's on the questionnaire and on the training of your enumerators. Sa questionnaire, aside from dun sa wording, alimbawa, lalo na dun sa mga studies concerned about attitudes and perceptions, minsan may ginagawa silang technique na parang same characteristic pero different questions. Parang same same perception yung minemeasure mo doon pero magkaibang way lang phrase yung question just to validate if indeed the respondent understood the question correctly. So ang idea kasi dapat pares ng distribution yon otherwise may mali doon sa question questionnaire natin. So talagang babalik talaga sir dun din sa researcher. How did you frame your questions? Kasi I agree sir, may mga questions kasi na medyo leading. Alam mo yung talagang uh, sinesqueeze mo yung participant na mag dito sa particular answer na ito no, na dapat hindi natin ginagawa. Our questions should be as neutral as possible to obtain yung ating mga genuine responses from our uh, participants, mga respondents natin. So, thank you, Sir Enzo. So, Sir Enzo, siguro po your final uh, words of advice perhaps po sa ating mga participants with regards to uh, stat analysis and quantity research. Sige po, Sir. Okay po. So, again, I would always encourage you to always think of statistics, not just on the analysis stage of your research, but most importantly, on the design stage of your research. Masabi nga nila, garbage in, garbage out. Kung ano yung na-collect mo na data, yun lang din yung pagtatrabahuhin ni statistician. Hindi natin pwedeng iharas si statistician to extract analysis tool, to extract information from the data that you have collected. And again, sabi ko nga po, ang statistics is an evolving discipline. Diba? Yung tool na ginagamit natin ngayon, pwede pa siyang i-enhance Pwede pa siyang i-develop. Later on, pwede tayo magkaroon ng panibagong tool to answer this research problem. So that's why it is again always important to seek for related studies. So ano ba yung mga studies na magbabak up ng evidence na pinapresent natin in our research? Thank you very much, Sir Enzo. So there you have it, everyone. Our passionate speaker for this morning session on quantitative Research Statistical Analysis Used in Quantitative Research, Assistant Professor John Lorenzo A. Yambot. And Sir Enzo, siguro I would take this opportunity na rin po to i-plug natin ang Facebook page ng UPLB Institute of Statistics. So, uh, ito po. Yan. 
So I would like to invite our dear participants to like and follow the Facebook page of the UPLB Institute of Statistics. That's www.facebook.com slash uplb.inset or just search for at uplb.inset. May mga comics din po sila related sa mga surveys na I think kagigiliwan ng ating mga participants or viewers. So I, I invite you to check this out and follow their Facebook page. Likewise po, with regards to uh, yung ating mga consultation services, I, I ano ko na rin sir, you know, yung ating uh, Statistics Institute of Statistics uh, website. That's instat.uplb.edu.ph and the UPLB Institute of Statistics is offering yung statistical consulting group. Uh, Sir Enzo, maybe would you like to uh, say something more po regarding our SCG ng INSTAT? Hmm. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> so, um, commercial lang po. So, the Institute of Statistics has a statistical consulting group that uh, you can uh, request for services for statistical advice, also for statistical analysis. So, nandun po sa website namin yung um, registration form. So, you can just click on the link provided in that webpage and at the same time, yung rates po natin for statistical consultancy. So, generally, meron po tayong two types of job requests. Pwede pong consultation lang, especially if you are just on the design phase of your study or the actual statistical analysis. So, you already have collected your data and you want uh, the services of a statistician to um, provide the analysis for your study. So we have uh, consultants that are specializing in several fields, and we are here to help you um, achieve the ultimate goal of your research. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Sir Enzo. And I agree po, no, all our team members po sa UPLB Institute of Statistics ay tunay na mga lodi at taga paglino sa ating mga research. So shout out po kay... Director Lisa Comilla po ng UPLB Institute of Statistics, thank you po for your continuous support. At sa lahat po ng mga nagtuturo, faculty, teaching and non-teaching staff of the UPLB Institute of Statistics, maraming salamat po sa inyo. So I advise everyone po to check again yung Facebook page ng UPLB Institute of Statistics. That's instat. Oh wait, let me go back to that previous slide. At uplb.instat and yung kanilang website po, for if you are interested in consulting the UPLB Institute of Statistics through their statistical consulting group. So just kindly go to the registration form that you will see in that website. So thank you very much, Sir Enzo, and to the UPLB Institute of Statistics. So Team LRC would like to take this opportunity to thank our speaker for his valuable time. So to award the Certificate of Appreciation, May I kindly recognize in the Zoom space our director, Assistant Professor John Mervyn L. Embate. So allow me to read the citation. University of the Philippines, Los Baños Learning Resource Center presents the Certificate of Appreciation to John Lorenzo A. Yambot for serving as resource speaker during the webinar series, Research is Life, How to Ace Your Research Paper during the seventh session entitled Have a Date with Data. Common Statistical Analysis Used in Quantitative Research. Held today, May 12, 2022, at the Learning Resource Center, UPLB College Laguna, signed by our director, John Mervyn L. Embate. Sir JM. Thank you very much, Josh. And of course, uh, maraming maraming salamat po sa aking batchmate, Sir Enzo, for sharing your knowledge and your expertise today. Kitang-kita po natin sa engagement natin dun sa mga nag tune in ngayon sa Facebook Live natin na uh, sobrang enriching na naging discussion natin. And uh, ako na-appreciate ko yung explanation ni Sir Enzo kasi ngayon parang, kasi uh, aminin naman natin yung statistics, it, it looks very formidable and daunting for many researchers, most especially the young ones. no Pero Sir Enzo make it look like as if uh, statistics is an easy thing to do. Not really easy, pero something interesting, no, that picks our interest, no. And uh, na forward ni Sir Enzo dito yung relevance ng research, ng statistics, no, uh, sa daily lives natin. Kasi aminin naman talaga natin, naging prominent yung statistics in 
the recent events that took place no hindi lang sa country natin but ay nga behind the context of the global pandemic and nakakatuwa actually isipin na yung discourse natin ngayon on social media na highlight doon yung kahalagahan ng statistics and statistics has uh, been regarded as a tool uh, to know truth to know what is true no at nakakatuwa isipin na yung mga researchers natin young researchers natin on social media on Facebook live no meron silang commitment and determination to know what is true So panghawakan natin 'yon. Panghawakan natin yung commitment natin na alamin ang katotohanan no at mabuhay sa katotohanan. And with that no uh, on behalf of LRC uh, we would like I would like to thank Sir Enzo for being our beacon of truth, <laughs> our light today no for sharing us uh, kung ano ba yung mga dapat gawin namin. Hindi lang sa research natin no but yung mga very important questions that we ask in our everyday lives. So at the same time for clarifying some misconceptions that we had about certain statistical equations or uh, strategies and tools no uh, so sir enzo hindi ito yung katapusan ng ating partnership no kasi may mga niluluto pa tayo with the institute of statistics and hopefully ay yung mga nag-tune in ngayon sa facebook natin ay mag-tune in pa rin at maging kabahagi pa rin natin no doon sa pag-highlight natin ng kahalagahan ng statistics sa ating buhay and with that thank you very much sir enzo thank you sir thank you lrc <laughs> Thank you very much, Sir Enzo. Thank you, Sir JM, po, for your uh, kind words, pa. So I agree, Sir, no, sa ati mga lodi sa UPLB Institute sa Statistics. Marami pa po tayo mga future programs na iluluto. So abang-abang na lang po ang ati mga students sa mga gagawin pa po natin mga pakulo. So thank you, Sir JM, and thank you, Sir Enzo. And Sir Enzo, may mga nagano po nag ang tumakaawa po sa comment section na pwede daw po sagutin yung question nila. <laughs> Siguro po pag later na po pag ano, free po ang time nyo po, no? Piling ko po kasi mga hindi makakatulog po ito pag hindi nasagutan yung question nila. <laughs> Sige po, Sir Enzo. Thank you po. Ayan. So, for the evaluation of our session, please do not forget to answer the evaluation form after this webinar to receive your e-certificate of attendance. So, your comments and suggestions will be deeply appreciated by our team, hashtag Team LRC. So the evaluation link is being shown right now on your screen, and I've already placed it or pinned it in the comment section of our FB Live. We also scan the QR code, so you'll be directed to the evaluation form directly, right away. So sa ating mga teachers po, if you uh, invited your students to attend, uh, kindly take a screenshot of this slide, and you may want to send this to your Uh, students so they can receive their e-certificates. So please be reminded that the deadline of responses is only until 10 p.m. tonight to give our system enough time to reset before the next session, okay? So last 10 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, so I hope na screenshot na po na ating mga teachers and ating mga students. So... Join us po. I invite you to join us tomorrow. Tomorrow, agad-agad na bukas na ulit para magkadugtong ang ating quantitative and qualitative research discussions. So I invite everyone to join us for our next session, our eighth session in this webinar series entitled Quality Assured, Qualitative Research and Data Analysis together with our director. Walang iba, kundi ang aming leader ng Team LRC, si Sir J.M. Mbate. So he will be discussing naman kung kanina na pag-usapan natin with Sir Enzo ang quantitative research. We will be talking about qualitative research tomorrow together with Sir James. So hindi pa po kayo nakakapag-register, kindly do so. The registration link is being shown on your screen dyan sa may lower corner. So I hope you join us tomorrow so for our qualitative research discussion. So hashtag Team LRC. Would like to thank everyone who has been part of our team and the Research is Life team, headed by our director, Sir Jim Mbate, with the support of our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Dr. Janet H. Malata Silva. On our technical side is our Project Development Associate, Ms. Ana Margarita Palma. A big shout out to Hashtag Team LR6 members. Sir Enzo, bago ko po makalimutan, pinapaabot ni Ate She, ni Ms. Cheryl Hermosa, ibaran ng kanyang pagbati po sa inyo. 
Namimiss na doon niya po ang ating mga learning sessions together. So, shout out po kay Ate She. And kay Baby Claire. Hi, Baby Claire. And to Tita Allen and Kuya Iwag. And a big thank you once again to Sir Enzo, our very passionate speaker for this morning. So, to end, let me share with you my thoughts my, from this session. So, statistical knowledge helps you use the proper methods to collect data, employ the correct analysis, and effectively present your research results. So always remember, mga kaibigan, that statistics is a crucial process behind how we make discoveries in your research. Make decisions based on data and make yung ati mga claims or predictions. So always remember to be careful, very careful when you handle, and most importantly, when you interpret your data sa inyo po mga research. Hashtag Research is life. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Stay hopeful, stay healthy, and stay safe. And we'll see you tomorrow. Maraming salamat po. And have a good day.